Thanks so much for joining us today on the Open Notes podcast by the Fort Collins Symphony. I am joined here by Otto Carrillo. Otto, thanks so much for being here. Delighted to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. Could you give us just a quick introduction to who you are and what you do? So uh, my name is Otto Carrillo. I play the French horn. I've been playing the Chicago Symphony for 21 years now. I grew up in Chicago, um, was born in Guatemala, however, but didn't move to the Chicago area until about one and a half years old and um, started playing the horn around the age of eight or nine pretty early on. It was my first instrument and I've uh, been playing it ever since. And um, now I am a professional horn player and pretty much living my dream come true. Yeah. And what brought you, what brought you to the horn specifically? My parents put the instrument in my hands. I had no choice. Um, I did see it coming, though. My All my brothers who are older than me, I have three older brothers, had instruments as well that were chosen for them. I think originally my parents wanted a jazz combo. So my oldest brother plays clarinet or played. My second brother, oldest brother, plays saxophone. And then my uh, brother who's closest to me in age plays trumpet. So they thought I'd play the drums. But they also wanted me to play the French horn because they knew how beautiful sound it had. And they also knew, not being musicians themselves, that the horn had a reputation for being a very difficult instrument. And apparently I could whistle pretty well at a very young age. So they thought I had a very good ear. So they thought, why not pair him with uh, the hardest instrument and see how it goes for him? So yeah. <laughs> I kind of I saw it coming a little bit in advance because I saw my brothers practicing and I knew something was going to happen for me at some point. And, um, and then, you know, they, they gave me with this pretty beat up starter French horn, which I still remember. I don't have it anymore, but, um, that's, that's how I started. And mm -hmm. the rest is, is history. <laughs> start you on the hardest instrument we can find. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Learning. I had, I had to learn how to read uh, music at the same time. So my mm -hmm. teacher not only taught me how to play and make noises on the instrument, but also how to read notes. So that must've been a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And you said you, so you started in Chicago and you're in Chicago now and you've been there for, for, for quite a while now. Um, have you always been in Chicago and, and what is it about, about the city that, that keeps you there? Well, my parents were kind of going back and forth at the beginning of their, um, my dad's sort of rise into his profession. And uh, we ended up in Bolingbrook uh, hmm. when I was supposed to, supposedly about a year and a half old. And um, because my dad was, was working around here so and then we moved to oak park which is a suburb of chicago i, I keep forgetting i'm talking to somebody from from denver <laughs> probably or colorado somewhere uh you probably have no idea what i'm talking about bolingbrook is a is a suburb that's in the southwest of chicago and um and oak park is right next to chicago it's a, it's uh, adjacent to it it's where ernest hemingway went to high school mm -hmm. ray Kroc of the mcdonald's founder fame went to went to school as well and so I grew up there and um, I don't know, it's something about the city. I've always, I've always enjoyed it. I never really wanted to leave home for school to go far away. Although I had a brother who went to Boulder to University mm. of Colorado. Oh, cool. Yeah. But the other three of us, we sort of stayed home close by. One of my brothers went to Northwestern. The other one went to University of Chicago. I ended up going to DePaul and Northwestern. So don't know why I just kind of stayed around and, and wanted to, do and see what I knew, I guess. And luckily enough for me in the uh, orchestral profession, I had pretty much the greatest orchestra yeah. on the planet <laughs> right <Yeah>. next door. <laughs> so that was really fortunate for me. Yeah, you had a good a good role model growing up. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And and so you've been playing with Chicago for, for 21 years. You you teach and you play as a soloist also. What is what does your schedule look like? Well, a typical week, I teach on Mondays. So I have mm -hmm. right now I have five students, typically around four to six students any given year at DePaul. Which I've been teaching, I think this is my 19th year oh. at DePaul. Um, and then the rest of the week, so Mondays are our days off at the orchestra. So that's why I teach. And then Tuesday through Thursday, we rehearse. Thursday night, we have a concert. Friday, either afternoon or at night, we have a concert. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday, another concert. Um, Sundays are off. Sometimes we have a repeat concert on Tuesday night, and that's where I have as well. We have a horn class at the Paul. So Sundays and Mondays are usually my downtime. Yeah. Um, and I guess Mondays 
are a little bit taken up with teaching, but they're sort of my downtime from just working on my instrument and practicing. Yeah. And with, with CSO, you're probably doing, a, you're doing a different concert each week and sometimes maybe three concerts in a week if you're doing like that's a Pops and Family something, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. yeah it's a lot. Yeah, of- <laughs> Christmas is the hard time because we usually have a brass concert uh, one of those weeks and then we have the regular concert and then there's a Christmas show that's an optional concert that most of us do take and uh, it gets a little bit, little bit difficult at times. It's just, you know, you circle that week for the whole year and you're looking at it going it's coming at some point and and, and you just kind of get through it but it's yeah it's rewarding and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's great and then so you're you're performing with the fort collins symphony on on march 5th 2022 we're doing the the mozart third horn concerto um could you introduce this piece to people who may not be familiar with it well mozart hopefully Everybody's heard of Mozart. Mm -hmm. Um, So he wrote this piece for the natural horn, which is, I always have a hard time describing this without having my actual horn in front of me, (laughs) but the uh, the natural horn looked like a horn that you would know with a big bell at the end and a small mouthpiece at the front with no valves uh, in between. So just a coiled pipe Mm -hmm. that um, looks kind of like a Christmas tree decoration. Yeah. Are you familiar with that? Um, so no valves. Basically, a lot of the notes can be played without using any sort of adjustment with hand in the bell, which is what people in Mozart's time would do. They would have the right hand in the bell to open and close to make different pitches. Now, of course, different pitches can be done by tensioning the lips, higher or lower notes. So you can get a fair amount of notes that way, but you can't get all the notes um, that Mozart required. So you'd have to have a little bit of work with your right hand stopping and opening and various degrees and it's, it's very tricky so so that's one aspect of the concerto however now with the modern horn we have valves so we can finger all the notes and so we don't have to open and close our right hand so you you hear open sounds a modern sound um of course it was written in the classical style it sounds like mozart it's they're some of the greatest pieces that he wrote in my opinion he wrote four of them that are completed and two that are sort of fragments that are, uh, there's different movements. Um, so the third concerto, uh, how would I describe it? It's, it's one of the prettiest openings that you'd ever hear. And it's just works so well on the horn. It's got a beautiful melody, has a beautiful, what we call second theme, which is just really lovely and gorgeous as well. The second movement is called the Romanza, which, as you might guess, it's just this sweeping melody that just keeps going and going. Last one, you get a rondo, which you hear the theme repeated many times, and it's kind of like a hunting horn, which is a very popular uh, form of, I guess, diversion back in the yeah. 18th century. People would go riding and hunt for foxes or whatever, and people would have horns while they were riding the horses. And that's the reason why the horn was valveless, so they can put it over their shoulders. And then when they saw something that was of interest, they can signal to the people behind them or whatever. Um, and, and let out a call. So the the last movement has sort of that reminiscence of a hunt. Um, yeah. So it kind of gallops along quickly, has a lot of spectacular f- flourishes for the horn. And um, as you, you might guess, it's, it shows off the virtuosity of the horn player. Yeah. One thing I wanted to to emphasize for for those listening that aren't familiar with the horn is that a lot of a lot of the notes that you're producing are happening 
in in your mouth. And you you mentioned that they used to not have valves, which means that basically everything that they were doing was was only. And could you explain that real briefly, just for sure. people who don't know? Yeah. Well, when we make a sound on the instrument, sort of like a violin rubbing their bow across the string, we have to create vibration somehow. So we vibrate our lips, and I can do it like that. <laughs> if you make a sound like a bumblebee, um, by by blowing air through my, my, my tight lips and it'll vibrate that way. And that's basically what we're doing through the horn. Now I can, <laughs> lips are a little dry. I can go up and down that way as well on the horn and make higher and lower pitches. Um, the valves aid in getting specific pitches that are not on a natural tube, which is without valves. So, um, so the, with, with the, now with the keys, I can play, what a piano could play every yeah. note that's on the piano, black and white notes. Whereas before they can only achieve that effect by opening, closing with their hand at some points, of course, they can get some open pitches still, um, but they were further apart. So now with the, with the uh, advent of putting your hand in the bell and the right, the right hand in the bell opening and closing a little bit, you can get all the pitches and um, it's very difficult. I, I've tried the technique. I do have a, a natural horn. That was made by uh, converting a valve horn and taking out the valve section. Mm -hmm. a, a, a former student of mine was tinkering with it, and he, he took them out and he made a natural horn, sort of a modern version. And it's it's quite challenging to play it this way because you you rely on nothing but your lip tension and this hand movement, which you just have to learn. It's a new technique, yeah. so very challenging. And these players back then um, were real virtuosic to be able to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much for explaining that. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume that you've probably, you've performed this concerto before. I think it's, it's a really standard one for horn players. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think it was the first one that I ever learned of oh, wow. Mozart for concertos yeah. actually. Yeah. So I have played it, but I only have played it with a band, a concert band. Oh, um, okay. So they have an arrangement for winds. Um, I've played this Mozart second concerto with an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And then next year I'm going to play the, uh, the fourth concerto with an orchestra as well, which I've never done that one before ever yeah. in any form. So, so this is the first time I'll have played it with an orchestra. Oh, wow. What, what's the biggest difference between the two? I mean, there's, there are going to be some timbral differences and, and maybe some dynamic differences between the band and the orchestra. I would think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have clarinets who are mimicking strings mm -hmm. and you have bassoons who are mimicking the cellos and that sort of thing. So I would imagine that this will sound a little bit more lush with strings. Not that the winds had a one dimensional sound, of course they don't, but uh, maybe in terms of dexterity on the instrument, I think some of the things are much easier to do on the string <laughs> instruments. Fast passages, for example. I remember the clarinets, when you're talking about a band, you're talking about not just one or two, you're talking about you know 15 clarinet players yeah. playing rapid passages and that becomes difficult to <laughs> to coordinate but they were it was a very good band actually so um they did very well but i would imagine those passages would be easier on the strings that's fascinating i didn't know that um i didn't know that band arrangements of them were so prevalent yeah i don't, I don't know if they were that prevalent but um for a big piece like the mozart concerto i'm sure you know it's been done in many different ways chamber orchestra or even like a string quintet or whatever i'm sure mm -hmm. people have done that for recitals and Obviously, the piano reductions yeah. are a very uh, good way of for any young child or student, or whatever, to learn the piece because that's probably the way I first played it with the piano accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how how old were you when you first did this this concerto? Wow, um, I remember practicing the romanza because it's the easier, I suppose, in terms of the technical challenges. Mm -hmm. um, probably my first or second year of playing. So oh wow, ten years old. Uh, it's the first one I, I, I learned. Other than that, I remember when I was in high school, I was in the Chicago Youth Symphony and our principal horn player, she had been selected to be in the concerto competition mm -hmm. and she was playing the third movement. I remember the Rondo, the, the chase, the hunt one. And uh, I remember learning it just because I heard her play it. So I was like, this is, I knew the piece, but I never worked on it. So I'm like, why not work on it mm -hmm. as well? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, so you you were doing the romance when you were 10 or 11 and now you've been playing with the Chicago Symphony for 21 years. How was yeah. how was your understanding of the piece changed? changed. Uh, <laughs> a bit, yeah. Um, you know, you just it's funny because I when I worked on it for the band concert when I played it with the band, I think that was in 2015. So that wasn't okay. that long ago. But you know, you sit down and you you kind of explore what are the things that you are playing on the piece that you've done forever and what are the things that you can bring that are new so there's a lot of feedback that you have to create so either listening by yourself or playing for others just to get different ideas and i mean where do these ideas come from a lot of them uh, are stolen from other great players of course um probably borrowed from other soloists in other fields maybe a violin concerto from mozart something Mm. anything that i can hear that will put in an added um layer dimension to my own playing is, is something that I'll use. But yeah, how how has it changed for myself? Probably a ton. And, and I couldn't even quantify the ways, just the little things that I do, even working on it now, um, trying out different things and seeing what works and what doesn't work and uh, trying to, you know, uh, overturn, overturn every stone and, and make sure that I don't, you know, leave anything untouched. But, you know, in that regards, I, um, I give myself a little flexibility to just be creative on the spot too. Mm-hmm. As a performer, so we'll see. I mean, I, I, you know, I want to do the best job I can do. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably in the end combine some of the features that are safe, but also some of the things that are risky, and, and okay. we'll see what happens. So it's, <laughs> it's my performance. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, anything else you want to you want to share about the Mozart before we move on? Um, well, the player that it was written for. He was a supposed friend of Mozart, and mm. you know we we understand that this person was a real virtuos virtuoso on the instrument uh, because of what he what he was asked to do basically with this with this um, natural horn and all of its technical challenges. So we we know that he was a great player, and and the fact that he wrote Mozart wrote all this great music for him is testament to to his greatness. And not only these concertos, but there's a a wind quintet there's also a hmm. string and horn quintet that uh, i just performed on a recital and it's just glorious writing for the instrument yeah excellent all righty and so what are your what are your moving away from from the mozart what are some of your favorite pieces of music classical or non-classical oh my <laughs> oh uh lots of I have lots of lots of favorites I guess so. They're not really my favorites. They're just things that I really <laughs> like. You know, I've really loved the music of Bruckner and Mahler, Anton yep. Bruckner and Gustav Mahler, because they write so well for the horn, and they're mm-hmm. great to listen to as a listener because there's so much depth of, I guess, sound and color. Bruckner maybe not so much. Bruckner impacts me in a, in a different way because it's simpler, but it's still, um, it's like reading a, a good book. You know, there's mm. there's certain. Uh, buildups of tension and then you get this great release and um, sort of triumphal music and Mahler has these different juxtaposed emotions that always run through the the pieces and I I really enjoy that plus again they're written so well for the horn I'm really starting to love the music of Ravel which I've always have Maurice Ravel but really everything that I hear um, even the pieces I don't hear, just something about them, so rich and, and layered. And probably not the best in terms of just for the French horn, in, in terms of just the, the sheer volume of, of things that he wrote, but, um, but for certainly for other instruments and for all the instruments, such a knowledgeable composer. In terms of non-classical music, um, I listen to a lot of non-classical music more in the car, probably, yeah. <laughs> on my way to teach. Um, I listen to top, top 40 is what you call it. I listen to a lot of eighties music because that's when I was growing up and I remember. And so that always gives me a, I suppose, a warm, fuzzy feeling listening to music of my childhood. Um, I listen to jazz, not as much as probably my, my dad because he loves jazz, but I do have a fair amount of jazz. Some world music I have as well. Don't listen to that as much. Um, yeah, I was just, my, my mom had sent me a, a, a YouTube video of, marimba players from guatemala which i know the, the music pretty well um it's a very distinct timbre of the guatemalan marimba and we actually have one at home my dad had oh, cool. to make one in guatemala and send it to our house when i was a little kid and so we, we actually learned to play a little bit of it 
and it's still there and it's it still um, makes the characteristic marimba sound of the Guatemalan marimba players. So yeah, I have a lot of I have a lot of musical tastes like most people. Um, but as a matter of fact, I probably listen to classical music on my own the least amount because it's what I normally do. I'm, although if I'm working on something, I'll I'll always listen to the pieces that we're playing for the week. So I think that takes up some time. But I, usually in the car, I'll listen to something completely different. Yeah, <laughs> something that's just a little bit uh, I don't know takes my mind into a different direction. I suppose. And do you have any like fun stories to share from, well, just about, just about any time, anything, anything, anything really fun? Oh my, uh, fun stories. Well, I let's see how much time I should take on this one. Um, <laughs> well, it's not maybe, maybe a fun story, but a very iconic story. My first time I got to play in Carnegie Hall, <laughs> we hmm. can just start out with that. Yeah. Uh, actually, the first time I was supposed to play in Carnegie Hall was with the Chicago Youth Symphony. I was a senior in high school and it was going to be our spring break trip. But I ended up not going because our high school orchestra at school went to Europe. And so hmm. I had a way going to Carnegie Hall or going to Europe. And in Europe, I was also going to solo with our high school orchestra. So I couldn't pass that opportunity yeah. up. But the very first time I played in Carnegie Hall, my uh, I was in the Chicago Symphony. This was about, let's see, I was already almost a year into my time in the symphony my son was 14 months old my wife was with me as well we were all in new york um on tour and we got stuck in the elevator right before performance <laughs> which i can laugh about now but it was pretty harrowing um so the the it was funny because i went into the elevator about eight five minutes to eight o'clock which is eight o'clock was our start but i did not play the first half and so mm. i figured i'd play around almost around eight fifty would be where I would start to play. And the hotel was right next to Carnegie Hall. So I didn't have far to go. So I, I, we were in the, ho in the hotel elevator about five minutes to eight. Going to get my stuff, leisurely walk over, and have plenty of time to warm up. Well, we got stuck. And, and long story short, we were stuck in there for an hour. And wow. I barely made my performance. And I, the only way I got out of the elevator, because they could not fix it, they couldn't get it unstuck for some reason. So the elevator operators had come up in the adjacent elevator, got the two sort of close together in terms of height, and they had punched out the panel of the elevator they were in and punched out a panel of the elevator <laughs> I was in. And as I had to crawl through the elevator shaft and leaving my wife and my 14 month old son in the elevator that we had just been in and not knowing what had become of them basically, because they couldn't fit through the shaft. They couldn't pass my son through that. Oh my God. Cause it was so, it was so, um, it was so, uh, so narrow and um i found out later after my performance was done that they had been okay but i learned that my wife was in there for another hour as they were trying to work on it and in in the end they had to just open up the panel a little bit more and she had to pass my son through the shaft to someone else and which she said was the hardest thing she's ever had to do so oh. <laughs> uh yeah that was a not maybe a fun story but a very um memorable that's memorable <laughs> wow. and uh, crazy story so that was my first time i played at carnegie hall <laughs> they say how do you get to carnegie hall is practice 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 but uh i went a different route <laughs> escape from the elevator so were yes. you you were like the shaft was below you you were climbing well, over? I, I, climbed, I climbed through it so there was hmm. you know about i'd say three feet between both elevators but there's a lot of cables and stuff so i had to kind of crawl through that oh wow and I'm not a, I'm not really uh, heavy. I'm pretty skinny, so I, I I could fit myself through that. I snaked myself in. I was also 20, like 29 years old at the time, pretty lithsome, I think. So I um I was able to do that okay. And um, but yeah, if, you know, looking back on it, it just it's my it's mind boggling. And when I got to the hall, uh, my principal player Dale Clevenger. He, he greeted me along with the personnel manager. They knew my story. They knew what was going on because I had communicated in the elevator to people. And uh, he said, don't worry. I'm going to get your horn. I'm going to put it on stage, meaning I'm not going to be able to warm up at all. <laughs> and yep. they had to extend the intermission about five minutes so that I can get cleaned up because I had grease all over me and uh, get my tuxedo on wow. and then get on stage. So interesting enough, my parents were at the concert. They had flown from Chicago and my wife's parents were at the concert. They were from Massachusetts. You know, we, we were a new parents. I mean, we had a 14 month old and uh, 
we wanted to see New York a little bit and, and they were there to help us out with, with our son. So they saw my, my principal taking my French horn and putting it on the chair without the player. <laughs> they were like wondering, where is he? He's the only one that's not on stage. Is he screwing up or something? What's going on here? So wow. yeah, kind of an interesting <laughs> you asked for a fun story. I, I, I could probably come up with, a, <laughs> but that was the first one that comes to mind. Uh, yeah. So fun stories happen on tours when we go with the Chicago Symphony. Just some amazing places we've been to. We've been to Japan, I think, five times. We've been to uh, Europe countless times. And the last few times I've been able to take my family on the starts of these European tours, and we were, we were able to tour um, be, before the orchestra arrives. And so that's mm. just wonderful to have the, the entire family i have two two children and um and my wife's and and just enjoying uh driving around and staying in different places in europe before the real tour starts yeah and the real work starts so yeah that's been that's been a ton of fun oh. to see the sights of the world that way that's awesome and what do you like to do outside of music besides crawling through elevators <laughs> <laughs> right staying in shape because i know someday i might have to do it again no uh <laughs> I play basketball a couple of times a week right now. We're on hiatus because of the pandemic and, yep. and being safe and everything. So, um, so I stay in shape that way. I love playing basketball or really any sports in the summer. We have a softball um, team from the CSO. We haven't played a lot in the recent past, but we have done more when I was first in the orchestra. So I, I grew up playing baseball. <laughs> so I love playing that. Um, I like woodworking. I'm a, kind of an amateur woodworker. I saw I saw your your music stand with the with the horn silhouette on it. It was very cool. Oh right, right. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I like to do things. I'm not a professional or an artist of any sort, but I, I like to do things just to see, you know, take my mind in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Not all these things apply to to music. Of course, you can you can make a make a nice study of that. You know, just concentrating on one task and, and being focused. Of course, you need that for music. What else do I like to do? Of course, I like to listen to music. I like to travel. We we've gone to. I don't know how many there's in the United States. Now there's 61, 62 national parks that are named mm. national parks. I've been to over 50 of them oh, wow. with my family. So we like to do that. Um, we haven't traveled in a bit because of the pandemic, but uh, I think going to Fort Collins in March will be the first time that I will have flown in two years. So <laughs> that'll be exciting. I'm, I'm excited about the, about that yeah. aspect. Um, and you know, I like to go visit the state capitals. I don't know. I think this is just a remnant of my dad taking mm -hmm. us to different state capitals and national parks as well. When we were kids, um, in a van and a camper, uh, trailer camper, and, uh, we would go visit cities. And, and a lot of times we'd stay, uh, we'd visit the national, I'm sorry, the state capitals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for some reason that rubbed off of me. So I have two more to go in the you know, whole United States and there are states I've been in, but I've never been in the capitals and those are the Dakotas. So <laughs> someday we'll see if I, if I ever have a chance to get to uh, Raleigh, I'm sorry, not Raleigh, uh, Bismarck, North Dakota and Pierre, South Dakota. Oh. Raleigh's in North Carolina. It's not even a capital. So anyway, <laughs> oh, it is a capital. Oh, I'm getting confused here. So I don't know. <laughs> you can edit all this up. I'm, I'm no help. <laughs> So yeah, two two more state capitals to go, um, and I'll I'll call it complete. So I wanted to do it before I turned fifty. I turned fifty. I turned fifty in December, mm -hmm. so it, that didn't work out. But um, I'll get there sometime. Maybe while I'm fifty, I can we can we can get there this year. Have you been to the Hawaii? Yep, we Hawaii been to, and Alaska. In Alaska, we went to oh, Juneau. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we were we we took our kids everywhere we possibly could. When, uh, we started when my daughter was three; she's the younger, and my son was six. And uh, we just visited as many places as we could just with them, um, getting them to love outdoors. And I mean, we're not, we don't rough it. We, we stay in nice places, glamping, I suppose you can call it. And, um, but, you know, just to, just to get them out and see the world and, and have some, just some wonderful memories with all of them doing that, you know, it'd be great if we can continue to do that at some point, but now yeah. they're both in college and it becomes harder and harder. So um we'll see what happens in the future, but yeah, most of this we've seen, I mean, my, my daughter, I think needs one more state to check off her list in the United States. And my son needs, needs mm -hmm. a couple, um, which is just, I mean, a blessing for them. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been great. So we got to go to Alaska 
and spend, I think two weeks there. I went to Hawaii, spent a couple weeks there and um, yeah, it's, it's, it was, it was lovely. That's a great, that's a great project. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Otto, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, you're performing the Mozart Third Concerto, Third Horn Concerto, um, with Fort Collins Symphony on March 5th, and we are we're so excited to to have you with us. Yeah, I can't wait. It's been um, it's been a long road for you know this whole pandemic and mm-hmm. and getting excited about performances. And of course, now I'm performing again with the Chicago Symphony. We have been since September, right, more or less regularly. But getting a chance to go out and get outside of Chicago and yeah <laughs> and just play with a different group and so I'm I'm thrilled to go yeah. and uh share some of my music with you guys and, and have that collaboration. Mm-hmm.